Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, well done for braving it through uh, all the uh, storms that we've had over the last few weeks and, uh, and not uh, cancelling your trip here uh, because of fears over coronavirus. So um, let's have a look at uh, Dark Side AI, um, the ultimate criminal mind, perhaps. Why are we looking at this? Well, one of the reasons is um, looking at uh, business risks. So Allianz, uh, which you might know as the uh, largest insurance company around Europe, uh, runs a uh, business risk report every year. And you'll see there, top left, the most significant risk to uh, European business as a whole, cyber incidents, by which they mean cybercrime, IT failure, IT outage, and, and data breaches as well. And then um, leaping in uh, on this uh, top 10 uh, for the first time this year is new technologies, by which they mean AI, IoT, blockchain, um, and all those sort of elements. So start putting those two together, and we get um, a bit of uh, criminal uh, artificial intelligence. So why do criminals do cybercrime and use AI? Well. Um, I thought it was pretty obvious, really. I mean, if, you get, um, if, you, uh, if you're a young, aspiring burglar, actually, there's quite a bit of personal risk, isn't there? Uh, you've got to go out on a cold, dark, horrible night uh, with a bag to put all your stuff in. You've got to uh, have something to be able to uh, make an entry into your target household. And then even if you do manage to do that and not get caught and, and escape all the cameras and everything else, you might get bitten by the dog and everything else and uh, run off with your swag and then you've got to try and fence it uh, through the network. With cybercrime, it's a damn sight easier. Uh, you don't have to go out on a cold, dark night at all. You just go to Starbucks. Uh, you sit there with your cheap £200 laptop. You use uh, Starbucks Wi-Fi and you just hunt around on the internet until you start finding something. Much, much more lucrative. Uh, <coughs> potential of going to prison if you get caught by uh, doing cybercrime is running at about 0.1%. So if you've got a 99.9% .9 chance of getting away with it, why the hell not? In fact, why are we all sitting here? <laughs> um, but criminal use of AI is thought to be at um, <clears throat> an early stage, and the evidence is largely anecdotal. Some of the first incidents that I've been able to trace back about sort of five years or so ago. AI is definitely expanding vulnerability as well because we're having less of a human interface. CAI, criminal AI, is largely unmonitored at the moment. You know, we're just relying on certain people um, telling uh, uh, the world that uh, they've, been, they've been hit. So there's no measurement. There's little monitoring or enforcement capability. And there's little political knowledge or will. And even if there is some will, we get um, statements like the Prime Minister this morning who said that uh, actually the police are only going to be involved in really serious crimes because he's got them earmarked, guess what, to help on the coronavirus uh, defence. So, uh, and then you've got other issues there, like uh, DevOps doesn't do security. Um, this uh, has been a real problem since I was on the DCMS uh, expert committee, where we pointed out that all these wonderful apps that you've all got on your phones, you've probably got about at least 50 or 60 of them, uh, on average, I guess, um, almost none of those uh, have any security built into them, and if security is built into them, then the uh, default setting is off. So uh, that um, doesn't really help matters much. And then lack of international cooperation, uh, and of course we've seen uh, various sort of nationalistic uh, approaches taken in a number of states of late, which isn't going to help things cross-border. So one of the examples of criminal AI, we heard um, two or three of those mentioned in... Um, incidentally almost, in, in various talks this morning. Um, but some of them are including things like deep fakes, um, not just on images, but on video, uh, worryingly, and on audio as well. Um, forging documents, uh, automating exploitation of stolen data. Here's another one um, for any businesses who've been trying to sort of set up and open a new bank account. Uh, that can be quite tricky, actually, these days. Um, and it's difficult, and it's meant to be difficult, made difficult by the banks for the, uh, to stop the criminals getting in, but it's stopping an awful lot of good business getting into the system, and hence you see uh, various results like HSBC losing about a third of the profits uh, as compared to last year, because the bureaucracy is taking over. Uh, and I have a number of clients who are trying to establish uh, accounts with banks at the moment, and that is a very real issue. Um, there, uh, criminal AI is also being used in trafficking, 
Um, whether that's human trafficking, whether it's drug trafficking, whether it's wildlife trafficking, uh, each of those three are thought to be three of the top five crimes worldwide. So the AI is used essentially at the moment, we think, in planning and na uh, navigation. So use of drones is just extraordinary. Um, uh, the amount of uses that those are being put to. You might have seen some uh, evidence of that with reports about drones being used to smuggle drugs and phones and so on into prisons. Um, and obviously that's another threat which uh, somebody needs to think about and uh, try and prevent. Chatbot cybercrime, so this is where we've had examples of a thousand Facebook users uh, downloading malware just through um, going through some sort of chatbot which has been set up by the criminal side on a fake website. Phishing and whaling, um, so that's where you know, the AI is basically learning your system in order to exploit it in the future. Um, creating malware, so some of this malware is getting pretty much the stage of uh, uh, becoming <coughs> undetectable. Uh, and then some password scrappers. So even if you have got a fantastic password um, uh, like uh, 123456, uh, which is the world's leading uh, famous uh, common password, um, it doesn't really matter because uh, the password will, can be scrapped off the system anyway, uh, if you know what you're doing. Cracking passwords, neural networks to predict that, as John uh, mentioned, and then fake news as well. So we've seen that uh, to some degree in the uh, elections which we've just been through. Um, and we've got big elections coming up this year in the US and India and so on. So with all this fake news flying around, it's getting quite difficult to find out what on earth is the truth. Um, in the old days, I remember, you know, we always used to sort of sit there and uh, have a look at the BBC and uh, that would be quite a credible news source, so we thought. Uh, these days, it's very difficult to rely completely on the BBC, and um, usually you have to sort of triangulate between the BBC, someone like Al Jazeera, and maybe even Russia Today, uh, and somewhere in there um, lurking might be something like truth. And then, of course, these days, uh, John mentioned that my daughter's here today, um, and she uh, very much gets her news from uh, social media. So, you know, how do you put things out there with a the, with the new generation coming through? So therefore, when we get to the end, is uh, criminal AI, is this going to be producing the ultimate criminal mind? Here's some deep fakes. So um, here's one of uh, a certain guy you've probably come across. Uh, which one is the deep fake? Can we have a quick show of hands? Is the one on the left? Okay, there's one, two, three, the, oh, a few more. The one on the right? There's a few more hands. Okay, now I've only given you a binary expected choice on that. Uh, who thinks both of the fakes? Okay, we have got some other people thinking in a different way, that's great. And who thinks neither of them are fake? Okay, now we've got a few, a few there as well. Who wouldn't put their hand up no matter what I asked? <laughs> uh, so here's the example of a deep fake um, just from last year. CEO of energy-based uh, firm thought he was on the phone with his boss. So this is an audio deep fake. The CEO was uh, of the German parent company. Asked him to send 220,000 euros to a Hungarian supplier. It was urgent, needed to pay within the hour. So he found uh, that was um, uh, quite credible and actually went ahead with it. So this shows a weakness, not just uh, in the vulnerability to um, establish a deep fake, but also in terms of the reaction. So uh, John here will have been on a few army exercises like I have. And when you go into a camp, from one camp to another one, you have a particular ask and response sort of uh, procedure to try and stop the enemy pretending to be uh, the home team and then getting into, uh, into the establishment and creating mayhem. We don't really seem to do that very much in the cyber world and I think uh, the one time pad and that kind of thing um, should be brought back. Uh, Deep Trace, we heard from them uh, earlier today. Uh, here's the results of a survey where they found 15,000 deepfake videos online in September 2019. 96% uh, of those, according to them, were pornographic. Um, maybe that was what they were looking at and focusing on, uh, which came up with the 96%, but um, uh, the message really is that deepfake is uh, definitely uh, advancing. And it can mimic biometric data, uh, potentially trick systems that rely on face, voice, vein, or even gait recognition. So the amount of things that you can do with phones these days and the way you're being tracked uh, is really quite extraordinary. So um, 
remember to take your iPhone out of your uh, clothing before you go and sit on the toilet because actually uh, there is a way of working out uh, from the way the iPhone moves at certain times what exactly you're up to. So we're into a bit of an AI arms race. So um, John's mentioned passwords. We end up with criminal AI uh, trying to guess those passwords. We try and stop that. We introduce some captures. And we thought, ah, that'd be a good way to stop them. So CI is uh, setting up some systems to be able to read those captures. Um, we uh, try and put out some real traffic. Uh, CI sits there and learns how real traffic behaves. So uh, we're into um, an arms race there with AI, counter AI, counter counter AI, counter 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 AI uh, as systems develop. Um, I just wanted to um, chuck in something else as well, because of course it's not just on the side of the criminal that we're using algorithms, um, but given the parlous state in which uh, uh, UK law enforcement is being funded, um, the police has cottoned on to this as well. Um, so uh, they are starting to use some algorithms, and you'll see some of those on the map there. Um, some of those colours might be a little bit harder to see, so what are they up to? Um, predictive policing algorithms are being used in West Midlands here, Merseyside, London, Kent, Avon, and so on. Uh, facial recognition, that is uh, highly, highly contentious, um, and there have not been that many rules um, introduced about facial recognition. So expect to see that's um, going to be a bit of an issue going forward. Individual risk assessments, case management, and then certain uh, parts of, uh, of the UK police uh, policing where they've just refused point blank to tell us what they're using the algorithm for, whether that's because they might not know exactly what it is or just sort of experimenting it with it uh, remains to be seen. So once you've got this data from your police algorithm, um, it's crunched to help public bodies manage vast quantities of data about people, places, events. Um, but there is no centralised, publicly available information about what the algorithms are being used for. And of course, they're all being used by different police forces, because the police forces, of which there are 43 uh, in the UK on a regional basis, and there's some of the six police forces which operate nationally, um, they don't really talk to each other uh, enough. So the concerns about human and civil rights, there's no transparency, the responsibility is unclear, and um, me being a lawyer, there's quite a bit of questionable legality about this. Which might not be a bad thing, because if you're acting for the defendant, at least if the legality is questionable, you've got a better chance of getting off. Uh, or you've got a better chance of not going to jail because it's been, you'd be uh, sent to jail essentially by the computer system uh, rather than anything else. So, um, examples of where the police are using these. They're using where to send the police, because you know, forces stretch thinly on the ground. That's obviously quite sensible. Who is at risk of being a victim? So you put the police where you might find the victims. Um, who is the likely perpetrator of domestic violence, for example? Who are you going to pick out of a crowd using facial recognition? Um, but also on things like um, what length of sentence should you have? So that's not being decided by the judges anymore. That's being decided by some computer program. Um, and goodness knows what, what goes into that, because they won't tell you what goes into the algorithm, because it's all secret. Uh, what is your likelihood of reoffending, and who do you let out on parole? OK, well, let's take a step back then, because we've heard a lot about AI. But when you talk to people about AI, they've all got different views about what it is. Um, and IBM did a survey uh, fairly recently on AI projects which are going on around the UK and then discovered that, according to at least to their definition, that 50% of AI projects uh, don't actually involve AI. So why do you put the label AI on? Is it just like uh, when you go down the supermarket and you see something which says organic? Is it truly organic or is that label just put on there to extract more money out of you? Um, so AI, this is a, a diagrammatic vo uh, visualization of what AI is thought to be um, by the, put together by a, um, a European Commission experts group. So the high-level expert group on AI. And uh, they've come up with a definition of AI, which I've split out and bulleted um, there for you. So that will give you, hopefully, a better idea of what we really mean by AI. This, was, this is the um, current working definition. They had set up with something else, which really didn't um, cut the mustard. 
So this has been developed out of that. But you'll see the overall thing there is for it to be artificial intelligence, there has to be some element of the machine doing some of the thinking, really. That's what it really ought to, ought to mean. And then um, AI includes several approaches and techniques. So um, the Europeans are looking at it in terms of machine learning, machine reasoning, uh, and robotics. So um, what about usage of um, AI? Uh, should we just allow people, as we do now, just to get on and develop their AI products? Well, that's pretty much what's happening. So it's, in legal terms, it's a bit of a wild west at the moment. Um, there are three key principles which this high-level expert group um, put in place, um, and they want to... This, this will essentially set the scene for future uh, legislation, which will come out around Europe, and then whether or not um, Brexit actually goes through and in whatever form it goes through at the end of this year, um, the UK is bound to be um, having to do something pretty similar, uh, if not the same, because otherwise your AI systems will not be judged equivalent with the European ones and you won't be able to sell um, to as many people. So you probably will have to follow whatever uh, regulation comes out of Europe. So it's lawful, ethical, whatever that might mean, because um, obviously what might be seen as ethical here is probably seen rather differently in Athens or Lisbon or the um, United States, for example. Um, and then robust as well. So from, both from a technical perspective uh, and its social environment. What does that mean? So um, the next said, well, OK, those are the principles. We need to sort of boil those down into certain requirements for your AI systems. So um, it would be, in their view, uh, and I think in most people's view, a bit bad if you had an AI system there which doesn't really have much in the way of human agency and human oversight. So uh, at a previous conference, I said, well, here's an example then. Uh, you've got uh, some AI device which is sitting there listening into my talk at the moment, uh, and it picks up certain words that I'm using, and then because of the algorithm, it just says, right, Parler's talking to all these, all these people about crime and use of artificial intelligence, and it doesn't pick up the flavour that I'm trying to give is that I'm trying to work out what they're doing so that we can combat it. Uh, and then the next thing that, that happens is that it instructs one of his robo-cops um, to come storming into the building here uh, and try and take me out because it's identified me as a, as a leading criminal. Um, and then, by the way, it takes all you out as well because you're obviously all accomplices because you're being trained uh, in this. So we do have to be quite careful, I think, to make sure that we've still got some human agency and oversight uh, in the system. Uh, and I would... Um, uh, I'm glad to see that in this conference, uh, more than other ones that we've had on uh, cybersecurity, there are more girls here, as, uh, which, is, which is great news, because on all my investigation teams, uh, we always do make sure we get a good balance. And it's not just because of some sort of diversity um, requirements, it is because we do think differently, we do approach things differently, and you need to get that difference into your decision-making process. And if you haven't got that in there, your decision-making process does, does start to suffer. So that's what I mean about human agency. Um, technical robustness and safety, that's sort of mentioned in the key principles. Privacy and data governance, we had a quick uh, chat on, um, a quick presentation on data uh, governance this morning and privacy. Um, that obviously tying in well with GDPR, um, that, is, that is huge. That really is huge. Um, so we've seen an awful lot of tech companies setting themselves up in the States. Uh, there's also an awful lot of them setting themselves up in China. Um, but every European one which sort of gets moving tends to get um, bought out, uh, usually by the Americans. So we don't really have much in Europe apart from GDPR. So it's quite curious, isn't it? We're pretty much regulating um, all the world's uh, data sort of stuff because... Um, Nobody else has really got to grips with the, uh, with the legal side of it. Last year, there were more conferences on GDPR in the States than there were in the whole of Europe. Um, so you can see how important that's, that's becoming. Diversity, I just mentioned that. Uh, societal and environmental well-being and accountability as well. So in terms of human agency and oversight, 
the AI systems really should be used to empower human beings and allow them to make informed uh, decisions, as well as foster their fundamental rights. So we do need to make sure that there is a human in the loop or on the loop or in command. Uh, we don't want them out of the loop, uh, under the loop, or uh, subservient, because that's when AI systems will get completely out of control, and that's when we end up with this uh, dystopia uh, of various sort of science fiction movies. Technical uh, robustness and safety, that pretty much uh, speaks for itself. Privacy and data governance, again, uh, we've covered that this morning. Uh, transparency, uh, we need to get transparent about this, and it's not just um, uh, you know, the people who've got their uh, data being sucked into the system, but also the vendors. And whenever you get a vendor sort of giving a presentation on the stage and you ask them anything about the A word, you know, what's involved in their algorithm, I say, oh, no, 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 no. You're not having any information about that. That's all uh, being patented. That's our intellectual property. Well, thanks so much for sharing um, your fantastic technology to defeat the criminal. Um, but also, if we don't know what's in the algorithm and how the decision is being put together, and there's no sort of constraints over that, then how do we know that we don't have up, end up with uh, side effects um, which are not particularly pleasant? So, I mean, you get that with all kinds of different medicines, and people are required to put out a, a warning about the different sort of side effects. Uh, maybe we should have the same sort of thing about algorithms. Just an early stage suggestion. Uh, we do need to have some kind of control about how we put them together. Um, so they do need to be uh, legal, and they do need to be put together in an ethical manner. Um, and humans need to be made aware that they're interacting with an AI system. That would be quite useful, particularly from a legal perspective, when you get sucked into something and the computer says no. And people just, as the admin assistants, as you well know, sit there and say, well, you're not having that loan, uh, basically because the computer says you can't. Uh, and there's no human uh, interaction with that. Diversity, non-discrimination, fairness, again, speaks for itself. Societal level of well-being, that also uh, pretty much speaks for itself. Accountability, uh, we need to make sure that that um, is paid full attention to. And then um, probably build in the Human Rights Act. So at the moment, uh, we have certain fundamental rights under the European Convention of Human Rights. This is separate. Okay, this is a separate regime to the European Union. Not a lot of people have gotten onto that, but this is quite important. Um, right to liberty and security, right to a fair trial, right to respect for private and family life. I think we'd all agree um, that is something we would like to have. In my world, the legal world, we're getting pretty concerned about this because this has been dropped out of uh, the Brexit arrangements. Um, and the promise is, is that HMG will put together some new form of, of rights, but goodness knows what those are. So do keep uh, a watch on that debate because this will impact on you. So we've had this high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. Um, but is that, um, uh, has that been distorted as well? So the 51 experts on there, when you look at the, where the people, where the experts have come from on that group, there is pan-EU -E coverage, but to be fair, it is pretty much Northern European. There is not much in the way of uh, input from uh, what is known in Brussels as the garlic belt. Um, so we need to have a, there is a combination when you look at the grouping of some people from data industry, there's some academics, some trade associations, but there's very, very little uh, input from industry, uh, apart from a couple of uh, companies like Airbus and so on. Uh, there's no input from law enforcement, bearing in mind that a lot of this AI is being used by law enforcement and the criminals are using law enforcement. This strikes me as being um, rather mad. Um, there's no information commissioner input either. So nothing in there really looking at it from the perspective of data privacy. Um, and there's no mention of cybercrime or the word criminal or the word uh, security. So we probably do need to get to another iteration of this group, but it is not going to happen unless the people like you who are s uh, sitting here before me um, get in and have a look at this 
it's all on the web. It's quite, um, it's quite transparent, quite open, quite uh, accessible. Um, but give it a view, and then if you've got some other views, put them in. They will be taken care of. I'm sitting on another task force, or sitting with uh, the key person at the European Commission on my right, the key person at the uh, Europol on my left, um, about a month ago. Uh, and they are very, very open to all suggestions, because they want this to work, uh, and want it to work well. So AI security measures, you need to work out pretty much why you're using those um, to start with. Um, as Simon Sinek in his fantastic book, um, Start With Why, uh, says if you don't understand why you're doing it, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, AI, I think, um, can defeat that in human terms. Then work out what you want to use, where you want to use it, when to get to it, who to issue it to, and how you're going to use it. Um, quite a tall order, because you know, even just here, when we look at all the vendors, some have got some uh, amazing bits of kit, and some of them it's quite hard to work out which little, which particular parts of, sort of cyber security uh, they're focusing on and how it all ties in together and which one is going to be the best fit for your particular business. So um, do you ask yourself uh, all these six questions. But remember when it's um, coming to sort of uh, the case of applying security measures to the, um, to the sector, you might be compliant, but do not <coughs> underestimate creativity of the criminal, the aggression of the malicious attacker, or the naivety of staff. I just wanted to throw this one in, this three lines of defense, because um, this is something which pretty much most businesses I come across have adopted, some of which, where they are regulated companies, um, have been told to adopt this three lines of defense. Um, this is a Topolchani castle in the Slovak Republic. Uh, this is one of the best examples of medieval castle building that there is. And it's got these three lines of defense there. It's got the outer moat, it's got the inner, uh, in a wall, and then it's got the keep uh, where, where all the prizes are kept. Uh, and this is the defense model that uh, we are being told to adapt. Please forget it. As you see, um, that castle probably did look quite nice in the 13th century, um, but it's in a bit of a ramshackle state at the moment. Um, I think John will back me up on this, that um, no army anywhere worldwide is building castles anymore. Uh, the only people building castles are Walt Disney. Um, so if you want to live in that fairy tale uh, land of, of three lines of defense, of uh, business, AML, uh, compliance and ethics, and then audit works, um, yes, please do change your approach quickly. So here's a much better approach. Um, this is uh, an integrated air defense system. Uh, this is a Russian one. I could equally put up a picture of a US carrier battle group. So what we do here, um, we have a different mentality. This is really active defense, okay? Um, the reason, uh, well, the way that you can see that this is really successful is because the Syrians had this from the Russians, but the Iraqis didn't. When we went into Iraq, uh, there wasn't anything in terms of air threat at all, um, because half of the Iraqi air force uh, was covered in sand in the desert, and the other half decided to fly to Iran. Um, so when I was asked to brief a senior officer on the air threat and I started off with the US Patriot missile system, I got the response, son, you seem to have got the wrong brief. We don't, we don't need to know about that. And I said, sir, with greatest respect, what's going to happen is that we are going to go in, hit the targets, come back out, and then various people at the missile systems are going to be really jumpy about it and they're going to think that you are the Iraqi Air Force. So we need to do something about um, making sure we've got no conflict with the Patriot missile system. So how these systems work is that you've got a whole load of assets which are designed to protect the skies uh, from being attacked. And the only way to uh, deal with this really is to fly around it or just to stay at home and think of somewhere else to uh, some other way of doing it. So if you can marshal all your IT assets in such a way as they do work together properly, and the people as well, then you'll have a much better system. Okay? We don't really need to think about defense. We need to be much more aggressive with that um, and get all these systems working together uh, in unison. So what about um, criminal AI predictions for the remain remainder of this year, for 2020? Well, there's no doubt about it that criminals are going to carry on um, developing AI. It's going to grow and grow. Uh, deep fakes are going to grow in sophistication, um, and they're quite 
relatively easy to put together with certain software packages um, that exist now. So all you do is take a, a video or pick up a video of somebody doing something which you want to show, and then you just uh, stick somebody's face on the, on the top of it. Um, and the way that it's put together these days, it means it's, it's really quite sophisticated and looks very, very convincing. There is some software that you can get to detect deep fakes. Um, that's going to be pretty useful, I think. Um, Multi-channel phishing, um, that's going to come through uh, much more, so it's not going to be just email, um, but you're going to get it through uh, WhatsApp, you're going to get it through you know, various of the other um, forms of social media. Uh, encrypted malware. Facial recognition class actions. Um, so I mentioned that that's getting very contentious. There's already a case in Illinois uh, being run at the moment where various people have um, uh, been facially recognized with uh, not, not giving any consent. Um, that case is still running through. I'm not entirely sure what the outcome is going to be, but um, it's America. Uh, it might be an unusual uh, decision. So we've got uh, high frequency in money laundering. Um, High frequency fraud, uh, things like mirror trading, um, those are just fantastic ways of getting dirty money through clean systems. Um, I don't really want to go into describing how derivatives uh, work in financial terms, um, but essentially what you do is you um, run all the sort of uh, profits through one account and all the losses through the other, and then you come to settle them across, and this is all standard, absolutely standard procedure. Switch it around every so often, and you've got clean. Um, money laundering systems uh, working fantastically well. Targeted ransomware, we've heard a bit about that this morning. Um, more IoT. Um, as you'll uh, understand, I uh, don't really understand why it is that you have to have your hair tongs connected up to the internet, because I'm a bit follically challenged. But um, uh, there's certainly going to be much more risk uh, involved in, in bringing these systems uh, into place. Uh, and more IOET, by which I mean Internet of Evil Things. Um, so certain things which have been taken over um, by, by the criminals. 5G, if it sort of comes in and how it comes in, is certainly going to skyrocket data volumes. So if you're a data kleptomaniac, I mean, this really is a system for you. A uh, hundred times what you've got under 4G. Uh, I mean, if you can pick up even 4G at the moment, um, coverage of that in the UK doesn't seem to be particularly wonderful. Um, I mentioned if it comes in um, because the amount of new masks and uh, other things sort of fizzing around in the uh, in the atmosphere uh, is going to be so great just to get the data to move around. There's some countries are starting to question what the impact on the human is going to be. Is it going to be the equivalent of walking around inside a microwave? That's not really very good news for your body. Um, so uh, certain cantons in Switzerland, for example, have already said, right, we're not rolling out 5G here until we've had a proper uh, trial of the health impact. Um, so do be careful about 5G. Speed is going to continue to trump security. Um, cyber insurance, uh, that's going to be up, but do beware of that. An awful lot of the cyber insurance policies out there um, have been put together in a heck of a hurry. There isn't really sufficient data yet for the insurers to be able to work out what exactly the risk is and how to put the policies together. So what most of the policies out there seem to be doing is to say, right, we will pick up the bill, um, but only if you've introduced uh, Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus, as Emma was talking about earlier this morning. But of course, if you've put those measures in place, you're much less likely to be attacked. So really, is your cyber insurance policy worth it at the end of the day? And what exactly does it cover? Are you going to be able to go out and get some new hardware, um, get some new software, and so on and so forth? Cyber skill shortage, we've talked about that. Um, earlier today, um, yes, one, two million cybersecurity places available in the UK. Uh, the difficulty is, is, is what exactly is required by the employer for the particular cybersecurity role. Um, this is another area which is developing so quickly and an awful lot of the titles for the jobs didn't even exist just a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, some of them are really quite, quite strange. So I just wanted to finish off with um, another aspect of uh, 
AI, which is driverless cars, and who do you want to program yours? Um, so up there, top left, we've got a pretty uh, boring sort of drive, I would suggest. If your car, driverless car is programmed by the likes of uh, Warden Hodges out of Dad's Army. Um, if you get lucky and you manage to get it programmed by the STIG, it would probably be a bit more of a racy kind of drive, but maybe a bit unlikely. Um, bottom left down there, you might recognise him as Bill Oddie. He's uh, also from Birmingham. Um, his claim to fame was that when he left... Uh, King Edward School on his final day, that's along the Bristol Road leading out of town, down towards the southwest. Um, he decided it'd be a jolly jape to go and get some diversion signs running. So uh, diverted all the traffic off the Bristol Road, up Edgebaston Park Road, and try and get it through the school, and then back out onto, um, onto the Bristol Road again. Um, so would you like a joker um, programming your uh, driverless car? Or um, what about the guys on the bottom right there? the uh, cyber terrorists, because driverless cars would be an absolute dream come true for them. They don't have to do suicide bombing anymore. Um, car just pitches up and you just stick a dummy full of explosives in and then it's programmed off to wherever you want it to go. And when it gets there, it's got a signal because the geolocator will say, I've arrived, and boom. Um, so there's a few other things. Um, so we do need to be, I think my watchword from this presentation is that um, all well and good, and we are developing a lot of AI, but we do need to be slightly careful about certain things, I and mean, that's where thought hasn't really been given to it in sufficient um, detail. So there you go. If you've uh, got any comments, objections, questions, or anything else, take a quick note of my details and get in touch. Thank you very much for your attention.